All right, so this week we are studying Daniel 10 and possibly 11, depending on how far we get. Um, there's um, not as much, I don't know, um, not as much to grab onto like doctrinally this week, uh, especially when we, get, when we get into chapter 11, but um, it might get a tad interesting near the end. Okay, so chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true and concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite and his face like lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision and had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking. And I, as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up. For I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to be and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face towards the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man highly esteemed, said he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what was written in the book of truth. No one supports me except against them, except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Wow. So uh, what are your thoughts on Daniel 10? So this was all a vision. Mm. Well, I think that 
this is kind of the introduction to the vision where he's kind of having an experience talking to one angel that happens to know Michael. And uh, but what's coming up is that is the vision that he got. But th what's happening before the vision is an experience in the presence of angels. One thing I notice is that Daniel just has a real tendency to be afraid as all can be uh, in the presence of this angel, even though the angel's saying nothing but, you know, peace, be strong, you're highly esteemed, do not be afraid. So it's kind of weird how um, even angels are so, I don't know, mighty and intimidating that it's hard for them to convince people not to be afraid in their presence. There we go. Um, what I find interesting about this is that the men who were with him didn't hear anything, but they knew something was going on. And what they did is they bolted the scene, basically. They ran and hid. Mm -hmm. the, the similarity, too, of the, of the man that appeared to him I don't have my MacArthur uh, study Bible with me here tonight. I got it at home. But I, I got to think that this is similar, a similar vision to what John had in Revelation. Dennis, do you have that? Does it say anything in your Bible about that? Uh, no, I got something about here where it um, talks about his mourning which means lamenting and bewailing. The Jews who returned to Israel were having great difficulty and opposition as they rebuilt Jerusalem, no doubt. Word of this had reached Daniel. He was concerned for his people. That's when he started his fast for um, a three-week fast. Daniel 3 is often used to promote what is called the Daniel fast. Based on this verse, the type of fast requires a person not to eat any desirable food, such as breads, meats, or sweets during the entire fasting period. There are some who teach that a true fast must be a total absence of food. Others point out when a person becomes older or has medical issues, it can be difficult to perform a lengthy fast as a person's body is weaker, cannot endure a long fast without difficulties. While it's pure speculation, it's possible the older Daniel abstained from certain foods and ate the more unpleasant and tasteless foods, just enough to keep his strength abstaining enough to mourn and seek God, the Lord will always honor those who do whatever is necessary to draw nearer to him. Mm -hmm. I have, um, I've read a book one time where they used this kind of a fast as, and, and somebody who's a dietitian claimed it was a really good fast. Because you're not really eating the meat or eating the stuff that make you fat, but you, you're getting the basic nutrients and vitamins out of this particular fast. I've, I've heard that. Um, and um, I don't know how true that is, but I just thought I might mention that too. Well, this too, when um, Daniel felt his presence and nobody else saw him, it's almost like Saul when... Um, Christ appeared to him, talked to him on the road to Damascus, and everybody else just saw like a light. They didn't hear any voices or something, but uh, Saul heard <laughs> when Jesus was talking to him. Yeah, and and you know that's I don't want to get into the ear, you know, into the uh, itty bitty spiritual things, uh, and and start making it sound like I'm talking science fiction here. But you know there is some precedent to. Um, a Christian receiving a vision directly from the Lord in the presence of other people with them and that person being the only one that hears but the other people are, are saying you know I feel the presence of God here you know mm. in other words uh, recognizing the experience as being a genuine uh experience uh with with the lord have you heard the word uh theophany 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it says whenever God appears to people in the Bible in some visible form, it's called theophany, from the Greek theophania, which means the appearance of God. The early appearances include when the Lord appeared to Abraham with two angels. Balaam saw the uh, vision of the Almighty. Uh, the children of Israel saw God manifested in the pillar of clouds in the day and a fire at night. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon his throne um, high and lifted up. And Ezekiel witnessed a major manifestation of God. Daniel saw perhaps one of the clearest and most detailed theophanies in the Bible. What makes this appearance so dramatic is that Daniel included details that, that matches John's description of Christ in the book of Revelation. Right, right. In fact, uh, I'm reading David Guzik's uh, commentary while you were reading that. He says the same thing, that this is probably Jesus noting that the description is remarkably like that what John saw in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. So it is likely that this is the Lord himself. Oh. Now we got here um, Daniel's vision and John's vision, a garment of linen, and then John's vision, the garment down to his foot. Daniel saw a golden belt of upas, and John saw a golden band around the chest. Daniel saw a body like barrel, and John's vision, his hair was white as snow. Uh, mm -hmm. Daniel, face like lightning, and John's vision, countenance as a sun. Right. And right. Daniel saw eyes like lamps of fire, and John saw eyes like flame of fire. Hmm. Daniel wow. saw feet of polished brass, and John saw feet like brass burning in a furnace. And Daniel saw a voice like the multitude, and John said voice like the sound of many waters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very, very similar descriptions. Exactly right. Very, very similar descriptions. It goes back to what we've been saying, I think, each of the last two weeks is that this portion of Daniel can very well be overlaid with many of the um, visions that John saw in Revelation. Is it possible that they saw the same thing? Possibly. Um, the, the messages are a little different, but still they point to hope in the future. Hi, Drew. I think he's having audio. Uh, he hasn't connected his audio, so I don't know if we'll be able to hear him. Uh, hey, Drew, can you hear us okay? Apparently not. Okay. Can you hear? <laughs> I could throw up a PowerPoint real quick, see if that helps. Yeah, you might do it briefly, yeah. Okay. Um, um, all right, let me go screen share. <laughs> okay. I love this. This is too good. Problems, problem solve, solving, Rob. <laughs> well, you know, one back to one thing. I want, I want to just briefly say to you, Dennis. It, it, it's a follow up. I think you read in your Bible there, your study Bible, something about Paul on the road to Damascus. He had a theophany. He had a, a Christophany, where he saw Jesus. Jesus came to him. The others in his party knew that there was an angelic or a holy presence, but it was Paul that heard. Right. Paul that was being addressed, none of the people with him. And this is really similar to that as well. One okay. thing, I, I don't know if we're still on the Michael uh, and, and the other um, angelic-like figure here. Um, I, think, mm -hmm. I think I heard a David Jeremiah sermon once where he thought that that might be Jesus, but then he read on a part where it said that uh, he got detained by the Prince of Persia until Michael came and helped him, and he thought, man, that's not the Lord I know. 
my, my Jesus wouldn't need help from an angel to him defeat some Persians, keeping him in place or something. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and even uh, the study I'm Bible I'm looking at right here online, he says something similar to what you just said, uh, Robert, that Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. In other passages, Michael is associated with the battle between good angels and evil angels, Revelation 12, Jude 9. Uh, came to help me. This phrase may be the most compelling reason to think that this me is not Jesus, despite the remarkably uh, remarkable similarity between the certain man of Daniel 10 and the vision of Jesus in Revelation 1. Though Jesus received angelic assistance as an incarnate man in Mark 1, 13 and Luke 22, it is difficult to think of him needing or receiving angelic help before the incarnation. Um, yeah, I got the same thing here. It's a the angel strengthened Daniel when he touched him. Angels were assigned to minister to Christ after his 40-day fast in Matthew, when Christ was traveling um, in prayer to Gethsemane, an angel was sent to strengthen him in Luke 22, and angelic messengers were assigned as ministering spirits who ministered to the righteousness in Hebrews 1, 4, uh, 14. Yeah. I, I'm just saying um, there's just a lot of similarities here uh, between the two. And and it's worth thinking that, okay, is Dan, did Daniel receive the message that John received 500 years later? I think it is. I think it's a, just a separation of about 500 years. Wow. Could be. All right, so I guess we could go into chapter 11 here. We probably can finish this one tonight. Yeah, go uh, ahead. All right, so 11 verse 2. Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will appear in Persia, and then a, a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will appear who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exer or will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north and make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be handed over together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise and take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter this fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south. Um, let's see. But will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Oh, Alice is knocking on the door here. <laughs> then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. Then, so Alice, we are in uh, Daniel 11, starting at verse 12. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north must 
will muster a, another army larger than the first, and after several years, he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. The violent men among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified sea. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire empire and kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom. But his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them, but a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back upon him. After this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall and be seen no more. His successor will send out a Let's see, his successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in a battle. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully, and with only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot to, uh, the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large army and very powerful army. He will not be able to stand against, because the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. Would somebody like to read verse 29 through 35? Guys, I have an old King James version, and that's all I have. So somebody I'll, else is going to read it. Uh, at the appointed time, he will invade the south again. But this time, the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him, and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the holy covenant. He will return to show favor to those who forsake his holy covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up an abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time or th uh, of the end. For 
it will still come at the appointed time. Okay. So I stopped there because from what I've gleaned about commentaries um, is that up and through this verse here, it seems that most people agree that this is talking about what is now history from Daniel's day up until about the end of Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, and yet it was prophecy at the time, which is, is great for the Bible and for its uh, um, inspiration and all that. Whereas some people don't like supernatural. So they say, no, no, he was, this was written after the fact. Um, and it does spend a lot of time and emphasis on Antiochus Epiphanes here because he was pretty much a menace to the Jews and I guess he really left his mark on them. But come verse 36, well, I've seen a couple of different Christian apologetics websites. And one of them is a, some apologetics UK thing. And another one is a gotquestions.org. I think gotquestions does a pretty good job. I think that for verses 36 to 39, they seem to indicate it can kind of go two different ways. You know, it can continue along the, well, actually, we haven't got there yet. So maybe we'll just kind of try to wrap up what we just read up until then. Any comments on like the first 35 verses of this chapter? I, I'd like to share what uh, my the study Bible that I have here online says. And it says that the chapter contains one of the most specifically fulfilled prophecies of the Bible, predicting history over some 375 years and to the end with amazing accuracy. And, you, and then his next comment is very similar to what you said, Robert. The chapter is so specific that many critics who deny supernatural revelation have insisted that it is history and it was written after the fact. However, um, it, um, I think a lot of biblical archeologists have proven that this is indeed the book of Daniel written before all of these bits of history that uh, it was, it's describing in the 10th chapter. That probably goes like the beginning we were talking about like, a lot of people thought the book of Daniel was written 400 years after all right. these facts, which would probably fall into that theory. Right. And, and is claiming that, oh, it, it was written after the fact. And because, but no, this is in fact one of the most accurate or one of the most exact examples of how prophetic this book is in that. I heard a figure that 85% of the prophecies made in this book have been fulfilled. They've been fulfilled. Um, and this is an example of, of a key time in ancient history, uh, marking the time of, um, uh, was it Antiochus Epiphanes? Is that who it was, Robert? Um, and also... Um, the Persian king Xerxes, um, it, the, it, it deals also with... I got a thing here, Antioch Epiphanes right here. Is, there's a bronze uh, statue of a man taking a, a, a pig for a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And it says, and Jews do not sacrifice swine of any kind. Correct. Correct. That could have been part of the abominations they talked about and everything too. Right, right. Because the epiphany, uh, um, the, um, the, the cleansing of the temple was by the Maccabees, the, the revolt of the Maccabees. And, um, and that's where Hanukkah comes in. And, and that's why, uh, but just, to, I'm trying to encapsulate this. Um, real quick and yeah i'll call you later javier javier just said hi to everybody mm -hmm. um <clears throat> this is a great example of what the bible was all about and what makes this bible so so above all other inspirational spiritual writings ancient writings is that this thing 
predicted history before it happened. I mean, it was and and exactly what happened. And uh, yeah, we talk about all the prophecies uh, that led to the uh, to 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 the Messiah and everything about the ministry of Jesus. However, we got to also remember it predicted the rise and fall of kingdoms. And we're reading about that prophecy before these kingdoms even existed. And what happened to them? Yeah, when my Bible in here has Daniel's prediction proven in history to back off what you said, uh, the 11th chapter of Daniel details the numerous wars between the kings of Egypt and the regions of Syria and Babylonia. The amazing history brings the reader through the rule of Alexander the Great to Antiochus the Fourth, Epiphanes, and continues relating events leading to the same t uh, the time when the Antichrist will plant his headquarters between the seas and the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea in the glorious holy mountain Israel, Daniel 11.45. Note the angel of the Lord reveals this entire narrative. Some scholars suggest that certain parts of this chapter must have been added many years after the events predicted had transpired as the prophecies told too many details that have been fully historically accurate. However, the angel of the Lord gave the information long before the events occurred. It is not impossible for God to have revealed a detail of future events as the Bible itself is a book of prophecies. Without doubt, these 45 verses communicate the great detail events that have already been fulfilled in history. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, who would it have been written to? I mean, who, who would have read this at, the, at his at the time if daniel you know if he's writing all this stuff down uh and, and the people around him they ran when he started having that vision they all took off uh who would he have given this to well he, probably he transcribed it and it became a part of the talmud it became part of the law and the prophets and was kept in the temple. Oh, okay. And, uh, and so it was, you know, uh, the, basically the Pharisees, Sad, well, maybe not the Sadducees, but definitely the Pharisees would have known this, would have read this. Now, so it would they have realized that it was Torah. fulfilled in their time? Probably. So it wasn't part of the Torah, but it was like mm -hmm. they still had the roles and read about this too, right? Right, because the Torah, the Torah would be considered... That, that's the first five books. So. Five books of the Bible, right. That's the law. But isn't it part of the Talmud? I, I use the word Talmud is because that includes... All you know, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, yeah. Lamentations, all the, all the prophecies. Huh? Yeah, I think I think right. the Talmud includes all that and a little bit of rabbinical writing. And I think the the, the old the word for Old Testament basically would be Tanakh, T A N A K H, is kind of like our Old Testament. I'm okay. pretty sure. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. But but the point is, is that they would have you know the rabbinical scholars would have been studying this at the time of Jesus. Okay. They probably would have realized that Daniel was fulfilled at the time of Jesus, except for maybe this end part. Um, where did you stop, Robert? Oh, uh, I stopped just before 36. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, I know, bef I know that now, even now, in the, uh, in the synagogue, they read, they read, uh, uh, verse or a chapter or whatever of a passage from from the torah and from the prophecies and from the um what comes after the prophecies anyway they they read those they are they are um prescribed in every for every synagogue to read the same thing correct um right and so yeah okay to the point of memorization in some yeah, cases some are, in some cases yeah yeah in some cases but um up until the point where we have been where we're reading um he said this 
verse 36. I think he's about right. That was fulfilled in the ensuing 375 years. And now then this was after this was after the 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 country was uh, divided, right, from the north and the south. The, the 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 Jewish is this after the Jewish? Well, well, division? okay, okay. When you have Judah and Israel, that came right. before this time because okay. this. Remember, Daniel was written yeah. while they were in exile in Babylon, uh, Babylonia. Okay. So the 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 divided kingdom happened prior to the exile. In fact, okay. it was why there was an exile because ne neither Israel nor Judah would follow in the ways of God. And God turned them over to the Babylonians okay. to deal with them. I'd like to hear what I have is I have a little thing here called the evil Antiochus epiphanies. That's from uh, 11, 21 through 34. Is that a large portion of the prophetic prediction of Daniel 11, 21 through 34 alludes to the uh, Seleucid king named Antioch of Phisines, called a vile person in verse 21. He was not to obtain the kingdom, but use his influence and words to flatter relatives to get their assistance. And he paid tribute to Rome to gain their favors. He most noted acts involved Jerusalem, the temple, and the high priest, according to two uh, Maccabees 4, 4 through 10, Antiochus deposed the Jewish high priest and replaced him with one named Jason, who paid the vile Antioch money for the lofty position. In time, the agreement between Jason and Antioch was broken, and Antioch installed his own high priest, uh, Melanius, who was willing to pay out more money than Jason did for the position. The Jews called Antiochus, Antiochus the madman, uh, for more about this evil ruler, see the article, The Rise of the Little Horn of Prophecy at Daniel 7, 8, because I think the, the Antioch uh, Epiphanes was like the little, little horn that we talked about earlier. Yeah, that's interesting. So Dennis, I mean, Dennis do you want to tell me what verses of this chapter year commentary was talking about just now? Dennis. Hey, Dennis, that commentary you just read to us, can you tell me which verses it was referring to in Daniel? Um, 11, 21 through 34. Okay, great. Okay, so I think what, what I've researched, so we're now gonna study 36 to 39. I've got two different like Christian apologetics pages that kind of give different opinions about 36 to 39. Uh, gotquestions.org is content to say it still is consistent with Antiochus at this point, but another page, this Apologetics UK page, is saying this is just kind of different from what's before. And, you know, there's this, you could say that, you know, verse 35, you know, something about the time until the end and for some point in time, it sounds like it could be a breaking point for time. The king will do as he pleases. It could be a transition point. Or, well, we'll just read this and see how this one could go either way, perhaps. He says, the king, so starting in verse 36, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the, for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those, he, those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. So... Got question says that that could still be Antiochus. Another page says that may be off in the future. What do your commentaries say, or what do you think? Well, my commentary says somewhat um, that it, because of a comment in Daniel 10, 14, 
And now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. Um, because of that comment, they think that right here, this passage we just read is referring to an end times Antiochus Epiphanes. A we'll sort of a the, last days Antiochus we'll about Epiphanes. About the Antichrist. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. And um, the Apostle Paul, I'm reading here from um, that. Uh, okay, let me. I'm trying to read read the commentary here and and try to interpret it into plainer language. Jesus specifically said the real abomination of desolation was in the future. He said that in Matthew twenty four fifteen. So knowing that Antiochus Epiphanes came before Christ, knowing that, it's likely that this section here is referring to the Antichrist. The Apostle Paul paraphrased this uh, Daniel 11.36 in reference to the coming Antichrist. He said in 2 Thessalonians 2, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay? So, what our commentator is saying is this passage in Daniel 11 jumps ahead to the Antichrist at the end of the, revel end of the tribulation period. Because if in verse 36, 1136, the king, and I'm reading an old, this is my old King James, so forgive me here. The king shall do according to his will and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. That's the abomination of desolation that Jesus refers to in Matthew 24. For that is determined shall be done. Okay. So this is likely, I mean, we've had a terrific, in the 11th chapter of Daniel, we've had the next 375 years prophesied and accurately it became a reality. Now we're going to the end of time, to a latter day Antiochus Epiphanes, who we know as the Antichrist who will sit himself on the throne in Jerusalem of the new temple and claim that he is God and he is to be worshiped. And of course, that's when God inter God shows up on the scene and eventually you could read the, what happens to him in the book of revelation. Yeah. My so, study thing from 35 through 39 says in this passage, many scholars see a shift in the prophecy from the time of Antiochus to the time of the end, which you're talking about. Notice Daniel's wicked king will magnify himself above every god. A statement similar to Paul's word, the man of sin exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is, which is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Daniel says he will also speak against the God of gods, which he's referred to in Revelation 13, 6, when the coming Antichrist will open his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and then them that dwell in heaven. Notice that in Daniel, he worships a strange God and will divide the land for gain. Since his section in chapter 12 of Daniel deal with Israel, the division of the land refers to the Antichrist returning to Israel and dividing the city of Jerusalem again, as well as Israel. There, it's kind of interesting, too. Um, my study notes goes a little deeper into who the Antichrist might be. 
Um, you would think, again, I've heard over the years, people think that the Antichrist is going to be one of the popes. I don't think so. Wow. But um, what I, I can agree with is something that this commentator right here is saying, that some Bible scholars believe the Antichrist will be of Jewish descent and perhaps will also be a homosexual. Wow. Um, Maybe will be the first Jewish United States president, huh? But, <laughs> you, yeah, you, you, you wonder because the power that the you got to remember the what the antichrist does in the end times is he creates a peace treaty between everybody that hates each other you know and and there is a peace declared but of course we find out it's a false peace interesting you said that it's a jewish guy who becomes president of the united states i I don't know if the United States is in Bible prophecy. Uh, could it might be. be. It might be the new Babylon. Yeah, you're right, Alice. I because I think our 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 uh, economy is eventually going to go in the tank, and we'll be no different than most countries in the world. And um, and so it does give some rise for the Antichrist possibly coming from from Israel itself. Um, I thought he was more like European. Yeah, and I've heard that one too. And that's where, you know, somebody thinks that perhaps it's a, you know, one of the popes. Then again, I, I don't know. I can't see why it would be one of the popes. I mean, the pope is not anti-Christ. You can't. Yeah, you're right, but um, I, yeah, and that's why that one I struggle a little bit with. However, there is a a one world religion, which you know we got to be careful nowadays of people thinking that we have to, you know, uh, gather together with coexist. Uh, yeah, coexist <laughs> with. Seen the seen the that coexisting or has the Jewish star and the cross and the. Yeah, I've seen those. I've, I, you're right, Dennis. I have seen that. Um, I, I don't know. It, um, I think anything, because our world is trying to be more ecumenical, which is basically, okay, we all believe in a God, right? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Now, we, we're, let's form one religion. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and that's where the Christians have to be really careful. Um, you know, there's Mormons that claim to have been baptized in the Holy Spirit now, and you know, there's there's also and then and then Catholics that claim that, uh, you know, of course they're the ones that, that think we're all messed up, you know. But when you talk to an actual Catholic, they're the only religion. <laughs> I got I got a phone call last Saturday from a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, they said they're not able to go door to door, so they're calling people. And and I think, and then um, she kind of hesitated, like expect me to hang up on her. But I talked to her for a little bit and said, "Can I share you a scripture of hope?" I said, "Sure." And she read a couple things in Psalm. And I said, "Well, thank you for sharing with that uh, with me." And then, <laughs> but um, it's like, and so they're not able to go door to door now, so they're calling people. Yeah. yeah. Hey, John. Just on a side note, when since you mentioned. Uh, Mormons and some kind of new world, whatever. Um, I, I bought this cheap ebook that I you get a good laugh out of. I'm going to just quickly share the screen. It's a uh, Tree of Life Kundalini Yoga, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints explained for Kundalini Yoga. So apparently, this Mormon guy has gotten into Kundalini spirits, and he's brought a bunch of Mormons with him, and he's, tr he's trying to make them out to be totally compatible. Oh my lord! Really? Oh, I hear what you said. What did you say, Robert? That basically, there's this Mormon guy that became a Kundalini yoga practitioner, be, be very deep into spirits that come into you and mess with your mind and soul and stuff. But and he's brought a bunch of Mormons with him, and they think they're just totally Mormon Kundalini practitioners now. Oh wow! See, the problem is for those of you who don't know, the Kundalini spirit is is a it's a demonic spirit, if you ask me. 
but it mm -hmm. overtakes a person's body and causes uncontrollable shakes. Mm -hmm. And they think it's a spiritual experience. The Hindus think it's a, that they're being touched by God or whatever. Yeah, when, so I, yeah, go ahead, Robert. All right, so just to kind of speed things up, we're going to do 40 through 45 now, but I'll point out that uh, my, one of my commentaries online agrees with your commentary that things transition off into the future in verse 36. Uh, got questions, says, you know, we can let it be in Antiochus, you know, historically speaking, up through about 39, but then got questions, says, at verse 40, things totally change and they become unhistorical, like this is not history anymore and at it any way, any shape or form. And so they're on board with the future starting at verse 40. And here's what verse 40 and forward says. So, at the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle. And the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom... Moab and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt and the Libyans and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Uh, I think also got questions, they allow for sort of a dual fulfillment, like it, there may, maybe what they're saying is like 36 to 39 was like an overlap where it could be Antiochus and also later on the Antichrist, the end of the world. So who knows, may, maybe they're both sort of right. Uh, my commentary says that there is no historical um, evidence that that Antiochus uh, considered himself a god. Well, let me see. God above all gods. Um, um, that is somewhat true. Uh, I read that also. Um, So I don't know. It says that Antiochus Epiphany certainly did exalt and magnify himself above every god in a general sense that all sinners oppose God, but he remained loyal to the Greek relig religious tradition, which re revered the entire Olympian pan pantheon. Epiphany put a statue of Zeus in the temple, not of himself. This right. statement will be farly, far more precisely fulfilled in the Antichrist who sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, again, from 2 Thessalonians 2. So, and that's why he will, re he will really fool a lot of people because they will feel that, that he is uh, the Jewish, he is the, like the Messiah, that he has come, finally come. He'll, right. he'll, he'll fool a lot of Jewish people. Correct. And that, and that kind of gives some credence to what we said earlier. Could the right. Antichrist be Jewish? Because it's about the only, you'd have to be Jewish in order to get uh, Israel to be at peace with the Arabs, for example. Um, so yeah, it kind of makes some sense there. Now, God question says, as, as a way of Antiochus fulfilling 36 to 39, it, it does say he did whatever he wanted. He even proclaimed himself to be a god by taking the title Epiphanes. Now, Epiphanes, it's funny, I just happened to have studied that lately because the appearing of Christ is the Epiphania of Christ. We kind of we get our word Epiphany from it, uh, as in bright and shining one. So apparently there's some de facto self deification there. It says he chose the Sabbath as a day to worship him, himself, apparently. He went far beyond his predecessors in arrogance. He did not rely on the pagan gods, but on his own financial and military might. Anyway, I guess the bottom line is, that, but they're still saying it, it got questions. It could be both Antiochus and the future, sort of as an overlapping, you know, few verses where it can Refer to no, they're trying to be safe in their. They're trying to be safe in their commentary. That's what they're doing. Um, I tend to think it is more of a 
prophecy of the of the of the Antichrist. Um, I agree with you. Yeah, it, I think it, it's jumping. His vision has jumped into the future. It's interesting, though. Notice that, that he gets attacked from the south and the north both. So what's, it, what's to the south? Egypt. Egypt Mexico. Yeah. Mexico. <laughs> Wrong continent, Alice. Uh, okay. Egypt. Probably a, co a combination of several Arab nations. Um, Saudi Arabia, maybe. I don't know. From the north, who, what's north? What's the big? No. What's the big bad guy to the north of Israel? Way to the north. Oh, Russia. Iraq and Russia. 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 And and then he goes to and start wants to beat up on people to the east. Well, that could be more, you know, Iran, Iraq. Could also be China. So, you know, there's there's a um, there's a lot of possibilities here. And it's a it's an intriguing part of scripture. It's really great. I don't know if I have any more to add. <laughs> All right. Well. Say hi to Kayla, guys. There's Kayla right there. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I can't think of anything uh, else I want to add. Um, Robert, are you pretty well done? Anything you want to add? No, I think that's about all for me. Um, I guess um, next week is chapter 12. Um, we'll be getting back to stuff we're more used to where it's, I guess, well, just trust me. I think we'll be back to what we are familiar with. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess we can pray out and. Okay, go ahead and lead us in prayer. All right, Father, thank you very much for this time, this awesome time of learning and talking and uh, seeing your hand in history and in the future. Um, thank you for all this, and in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, thanks, everybody. Good to I like see that. you. Let's, let's pray out. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pray out. Hey, uh, like real quick, uh, to have everybody to pass the word, we have a really interesting uh, Sunday service coming up on this weekend, okay, online. And uh, so please tune in, okay? Okay. I'll be right. there. All right. All right. Bless you all. Bye-bye. I'll be there. Bye. Bye.